My name is Fernando Prieto. I'm the, one of the partners of uh, Gato Salvaje Studio. We are an indie video game de developer based in La Coruña. And we were the first uh, developer in Spain to launch a Kickstarter project in 2012. Uh, the first time, we were very ingenious and we presented a project that it was a failure. We, we, wasn't, we, we wasn't successful, but we keep on trying. And uh, after the next year, we presented again a project and we got more, uh, over $100,000. Uh, and Sorry, can you explain what the project that failed? Yeah. What was it exactly? Yeah. And also uh, why you think it failed? Yeah. Uh, I think the main, the main problem is that you have to connect with the people in Kickstarter. And uh, they, have to, uh, they need to have confidence that you are going to take the project uh, to the, they are, they are going to, to produce and to present the project, to launch the project. And when you, when you are a nobody uh, in the industry, uh, that is very difficult to get. So we need to have a lot of visibility in the U.S. to to get the project. And uh, at that moment, we didn't we didn't get it. And and I think we didn't. But describe the nature of the project. What was it exactly? Ah, the, well, the project was a, it was a video game, a point and click adventure. A video game. Yeah, a point and click adventure, an episodic point and click adventure called Ark, I A R K, and. Um, and uh, at, at that moment, the project, in fact, was the same that we presented uh, one year later, but uh, uh, we didn't have enough visibility in the U.S. to, uh, to get to the public. And in Kickstarter, the visibility is, uh, is a key element to, to get a project funded. And so the second time, what was different? Like you said, you presented the same project, Art. Yeah. The first time, you got no funding. The second time, you, you, got, you met your goal and probably exceeded in, what was different? Uh, we concentrated on getting that visibility. The first we did, we hired a, a very famous uh, script writer in the US, uh, his name is Greg Raka. He has been working for DC Comics and Marvel Comics, and he got involved in the project. He, he liked the project, and uh, he's been working with us since that moment. And we also hired a very famous um, uh, voice talent uh, who, who she has been working, Ashish Roca, she has been working for, uh, she's, she's been one of the voices of uh, the Mass Effect trilogy, uh, Talin Sora. And what we did was trying to get their visibility to help us to fund our project. So they are somebody, some people, they are known people in the US and we tried to, to get their so visibility. So the key, the key difference was in the storytelling part of Kickstarter. Yeah. Like you told your story poorly, didn't get funded. You told the st same story well, and you got funded. Yeah. With a better script, with a ver better video. Yeah. Uh, maybe this would be a good moment then for Stephanie to show us, um, since Stephanie works for Kickstarter, to show us how Kickstarter works, and from Kickstarter point of view, what makes a successful project, and what projects are being best received now and could be, and how could Kickstarter be used by people in Europe, Spain, even in Catalonia, about uh, being on Kickstarter? Great, thanks. Hi. Um, there was something else you said that I think was really valuable, which was the confidence part. So in the second time you tried, you were able to establish more confidence. I had a question for you. What was the funding goal the first time? The first time was 150,000. So did you decrease the funding goal as well? So, no, we reduced the funding goal to 100,000. The second time. Yeah. OK. Because um, I did want to point out to everyone in the room, $100,000 is a lot of money on Kickstarter. Um, I said this quite a bit yesterday, and I'll talk about it now. But most people on Kickstarter raise between five and $10,000, something like um, just over 1,000 projects out of 62,000 have raised over $100,000. So that's quite a huge success. Um, so this is me. Uh, I've worked at Kickstarter since September 2011. Uh, there's nothing I can do about it. It looks better there, right? Yeah? 
I think it's probably just the, yeah, we'll just have to go with it. I'm sorry, guys. Um, so this is me. I've worked at Kickstarter since 2011. Um, I've looked after arts programs for a really long time, and then um, now I'm doing international stuff. Uh, I've backed quite a few projects on the site. You can see I screenshotted this earlier today. That's over, that's 425 projects. Um, so Kickstarter, we are a place that exists for people to make things to share with others. Uh, this is a sort of a very simplified view of what we do, but it, it's very core, and if you get that, you understand what we do. Uh, these are our stats as of this morning. So we've been around for about five years now. We, in March of this year, we crossed the billion dollar mark in terms of dollars pledged, and we've had over 63,000 projects funded on the site. So more than I just cited, actually. I think more importantly, and this is to your earlier points about community, we've had over 6.4 million people pledge to projects on the site, uh, and 218,000 of them have pledged to 10 or more projects. So there is a real community on the site. There are people who regularly participate in projects, know what they're looking for, and really help bring these things to life. Um, people pledge to projects from all around the world. So in the, um, our annual report this year, we said that people from over 224 countries and territories and all seven continents had pledged to a project. And then, uh, again, this is from uh, January, so this is somewhat stale, but over 21,000 people from Spain alone have pledged to projects um, at nearly $5 million. We're probably at $5 million now. Um, just very quickly, I want to run you guys through this to give you a sense of the scope. I think it's really important to understand what Kickstarter means in the larger universe. So people are funding things like films. Uh, Veronica Mars is a great story in that it was very much a fan-driven effort. So over 91,000 people pledged millions of dollars to bring this movie to life. Um, people are innovating every day, particularly in design and technology. So the world's first 3D printing pen, which is actually now for sale at the MoMA Design Store. Um, people are doing really incredible public artworks and civic projects. Uh, this was a project in Rio to paint an entire favela by two Dutch artists. Uh, and film in general is huge. So film festivals around the world represent uh, Kickstarter-funded films at Sundance. We've consistently represented over 10% of the slate at South by this year. We had 30-plus films represented. Uh, this picture is from a short doc that won an Oscar last year. The woman crying is the uh, woman who was featured in the documentary. It was a big moment for her. Uh, over a dozen projects have been launched into space that were funded on Kickstarter, and hundreds of places to eat and drink have been brought to life on Kickstarter. So this is how it works. This is what you guys are all here for. So <laughs> we'll focus on this. Uh, this is the start page. So if you go to kickstarter.com forward slash start, this is what you're going to be greeted with. You say which category you want to put your project in and then what you're going to call it. You can always edit this. This is what the project build looks like. And I apologize for the blurriness. Go, go and see for yourself later today. Um, but basically, it's a template. You enter your information. You can build and draft, save, come back to it. I myself have several drafts going. Um, that I mostly use the demo, but it's, it's a constantly evolving system in that way. Um, and this is new on Kickstarter. As of last week, when you complete your draft, you can share it with your friends, with your community, with your fans, and get feedback. Um, and then if you're happy with it, you can just go ahead and launch. Um, or you could submit it to us, and we'll give you some feedback too. That's your choice. Um, so we have three basic rules. Uh, one is that you must create something to share with others. Uh, it's very core to our site. Projects must be honest and clearly presented. We really believe in transparency at Kickstarter. Um, and then finally, we are not a site for charity or cause funding. We are really for creative projects. That's what we do best. Uh, this is what a project page looks like. Uh, key to understanding how Kickstarter works, and for those of you who aren't familiar, this is what we were talking about a moment ago. You set a funding goal on Kickstarter, and you must reach it. We call this the all-or-nothing funding model. So let's say you want to raise $100,000. You give yourself up to 60 days. It's usually about 30 days to do it. And if you don't reach that goal by the time the clock runs out, you don't get any of the money. No, one, no one's credit cards are charged. It's like nothing ever happened. Um, we think this is powerful. We think, number one, this is why the system works. We think this is why people raise so much money. This is why over a billion dollars has been pledged. Um, it's also less risk. If you need $100,000 to make the thing you're going to make and you only raise $10,000, that's kind of weird. What are you going to do with that $10,000? Um, how are you going to fulfill on all the rewards you promised everyone? And then finally, it's just wildly compelling. You're not only motivated to see it happen, but the fan community that's emerged around you also wants you to see it happen. 
Um, <clears throat> a little less than half of all people who launch a project on Kickstarter do reach their funding goal. Uh, and most of the money pledged, 85% of dollars pledged, goes to successful projects. And we've seen that once a project launches and reaches just 20% of its funding goal, and in fact usually succeeds something like 80% of the time, and of the projects that fail, uh, a, quite, a bunch, a, quite a bit of them don't even get a single pledge. So a huge thing about Kickstarter is this community, is about launching, getting that momentum, getting that support. So as I referred to, that really tall green bar, I don't know if you can see it, um, represents uh, projects raising between one and ten thousand dollars on Kickstarter. Most people are raising that amount, something like seventy-five percent are raising ten thousand or less. Uh, so that's a lot of stats. We really think that that's, it's, there's good data and good information to be shared. It's all on our site if you go to kickstarter.com forward slash help forward slash stats. Um, but we'll talk a little bit about sort of the story, which we heard is very important. Um, so there's three ways you tell your story on Kickstarter. Number one is the project video. So this is where you introduce yourself, you share your ideas, you share your passion, you give us a sense of what it is you're trying to do. Then there's rewards. So this is how you invite people in. This is the direct or exclusive access someone gets for participating in your project. And then project updates. And this is like the blog that's built into every single project. It goes direct to your backers' inboxes, and it's a way to stay in touch with people as your project develops. And something like we talked a little bit about this earlier, if you have like a multi-year development timeline, this is a great way to keep those people in the loop and let them know what's going on. Uh, so the project video is typically short. Uh, the average used to be three minutes. These days we're seeing two minutes. Um, it's, it's meant to be shareable, so something that someone will see and want to show to somebody else. So think about YouTube videos, think about things that you share on Facebook. That's the kind of video you're going for. Um, and it's personal, so whether you're in it or your fans are in it or your artists are in it, someone should be in there sharing a personal story. Um, rewards are most typically a copy of the thing. So if you're making a film, it's a copy of the film. If it's a game, it's a copy of the game. Uh, that's like a baseline thing. Uh, more exciting, we often see experiences. So it's behind the scenes access. It's beta, you know, beta access or early access. It's getting to go to the artist's studio. Um, and people, of course, make all sorts of special limited edition swag and stuff like that. Um, but really, the thing that gets people to pledge is this patron opportunity, this way to participate in the project in a way that no one else can. Um, so we've seen some trends on Kickstarter, and these, these usually bear out across different currencies. So people are most typically pledging around the $25 mark. That's not a little bit of money, ultimately. You know, like $25 is like, what are you giving me in exchange for that? Um, and it adds up. Uh, the $100 pledge is the most powerful, so there's a lot of people willing to give $100. It'll get you further. Uh, so keeping these two numbers in mind when I'm advising people on their projects, I say, think really long and hard about those two rewards here. Is who are you targeting? Who are your $25 people? Who are your $100 people? How are you structuring rewards with those people in mind and making sure that they know about it? Um, you do not need to overwhelm people with a million rewards. Sometimes projects have just one, but you do want to have a range of uh, opportunities. So again, those $5 people in your community, as well as maybe the $5,000 people, if you're lucky enough to have $5,000 people in your community. And then project updates, as I mentioned earlier, it's like a blog. Uh, we, it's, uh, let's see, this is what it looks like. Um, you can see it on the project page. It also gets delivered to anyone who backs your project. If they give you a dollar or $10,000, they will get this. It's a way to keep people in the loop, to give them gifts, to help them get them to promote your project, et cetera. Um, and then finally, <laughs> uh, your backers. This is super, super important. Um, I think a lot of people going into Kickstarter projects um, underestimate how important it is to understand who your community is when you're launching your project. The majority of these people are going to come to you through your own outreach efforts. So these are typically your friends, your fans, your family, people who you know and understand what they like and care about. You understand how much money they have. You know how you can connect with them, whether it's on Facebook or Twitter or a forum or through email, which is a very powerful form of communication. Um, you structure your rewards with these people in mind. You plan your outreach strategies with these people in mind. If you do a good job with these people, they will tell other people. The Kickstarter community will discover you. The press will pick up your story and share it. People will see your project and be excited. So it's actually quite powerful that you know so much about your community before you launch. Um, so I like to emphasize this. This is not a crowd. It's not a faceless mass of people. This is a group of people who you actually know pretty well. 
Um, so I tried to go quickly in the spirit of conversation, but there's a lot more information in our help center. Um, and we also just relaunched this thing called the Creator Handbook, which is a place where you can get lots of information on running a project. I'm gonna advance. This is a video that should autoplay. Let's see what happens. Um, oh yeah, there it goes. And then we can talk while it goes like that. We can just talk. <laughs> okay. Uh, no, that was very interesting. I wish I had met you before we went on Kickstarter. We clearly made one mistake. Uh, which was we set up a $250,000 goal. And now that I see that you tell me that so many projects, that the, that the most common projects only get 10,000, we obviously hit the community for an amount of money which we thought was insignificant, but it turned out to be very significant for the community. And it is true that one of the problems we had with the gramophone was until people believed that it was going to be funded. Because if you look at the rate at which money came, it came a lot at the beginning. Then it kind of people felt, oh, they're not going to meet their goal. They're not going to meet their goal. And then when we finally got very close to the goal, then we got a lot more money, right? And uh, obviously that was, a, that was a strategic mistake. We thought, but I see the point that you made that is important about why is it? Because one could say, well, if you don't raise 100, you could raise 50. Why don't you? And I understand that in Indiegogo, you can raise 50 and not 100. Uh, but I see the wisdom of setting a goal and meeting it because, first of all, it's your credibility. If you believe you can do something for 250, you're not going to be able to do it for 50. So if you take 50, you're probably not, never going to finish your project and you're not going to deliver the product. And I would say that, that it, I, would be, I wouldn't trust the project where I give them my money and they only got a third of the money they, say that they said they needed, right? So that's important. Um, so let me share a little of, of what the, the considerations were at Fon to go with a gramophone on Kickstarter. So Fon has sold 13 million units of our other project, the Fonera. And if you go to France or to Portugal, to many countries near Spain or to Japan or to Brazil, you will see Fon everywhere, not yet in Spain, uh, hopefully soon. But we have 13 million homes that have our, our product, our core product. So the idea of going on Kickstarter for us was, was very different. It was something like we had a new product, the gramophone, which was a Wi-Fi router that shares Wi-Fi, the same idea of phone. You share Wi-Fi, you roam the world for free, connecting to everyone else who shares with you. So it's a Wi-Fi router with a private signal and a public signal, but then, we wanted to add music to this project. This is why this is happening in Sonar, by the way, because it's kind of like it was our link to music. So there was a music product called the Sonos. In video, there were a million products. In video, you had Apple TV, Amazon TV, now that just launched. You had Roku, you had Boxy, you had uh, LG TV, you had Samsung TV, you had everyone was competing in video. And we saw that in sound, there was only one platform really that worked well, which was Sonos, which is an amazing platform. And Sonos is awesome, but it's very expensive. And it's also a sound system. And we started thinking, well, we do Wi-Fi. Almost everyone has a sound system. The key is, what if we sold them the cloud functionality and we didn't need to sell them a sound system? Also because sound, and more here at Sonar, there's people who love sound. So people who love sound and are 20 years old are unaware that people who love sound and are 40 years old have heard better quality sound when they were 20. And that's something that is not the case at all with, with video displays. So as opposed to today where we're having an awful quality in the video displays, normally, Video displays got so much better. Like if you watch the TV from the 90s, it looks awful. A TV from the 80s looks even worse. A TV from the 70s, I don't even want to talk about. But get a sound system from the 70s, get a sound system with valves, and you'll see how incredible the sound is. So we were saying, well, maybe people shouldn't throw away their sound systems. Maybe people should use a little, a little gadget that would turn their sound systems into cloud music players. And that's 
where we had the idea of the gramophone. And because we were phone, the company phone, we call it gramophone with the association with music. That gramophone was the first, the first music player uh, and we wanted to pay tribute to that. But here comes the crazy part, Kickstarter. So there was a disagreement on our board. Our board was very split on whether we should do the gramophone or not. Because they were saying, hey, we grew 50% last year just selling phone routers. Why should we go into music? And why should we sell the gramophone? And also there's an incredible history of people like who are in music to lo and lose money. That music seems to be a money losing business for almost everyone. Uh, it's like the restaurant business where occasionally somebody does well, but almost all restaurants go out of business and a lot of people lose money in restaurants. The same thing making movies. A lot of people make, lose money making movies. But then there's love. Like I personally love music. And I built another company in Spain called Jastel and Jastel, you say, well, why is Jastel called Jastel? Well, when I studied Jastel, I called it Jastel because I love music. There's no reason. There's absolutely no reason to call Jastel Jastel. But now it's a you know, company with millions of customers. It's worth $4 billion in the public markets. But we used to do the Jastel Music Festival. We used to do the music. So when I started Jastel, I associated myself with music, even though music had nothing to do with selling DSL services and fiber optic services, which is what this company does. And here again, we have a product now where people love, who love music and say, well, music is something that people want to share. And so, so when I think of when I was 20, we used to listen to music. And when I see people who are 20 now, I see headphones everywhere. And not that headphones didn't exist before. Headphones, I don't know for how long they have existed. But I don't understand very well why headphones make plays such an incredible part of music now. So when we're going on Kickstarter, we're saying, well, is this too, is this going against the trend? Or is this like hipster, or is this just dead? And there was a lot of debate. Are people going to hate our product or love our product? And there was, because we were saying music is mostly about headphones, and we were bringing out a product that had nothing to do with headphones. It was a product to make music social. It was a product that people would walk into your apartment would take out their smartphone and play music at your place. So you would play music at your place and your friends would play music at your place. So just like we made Wi-Fi social, we were making music social. We couldn't agree on the board. We just couldn't agree. People said the product will never make it. Other people said, well, I, I personally love the product, design the product, the chief engineer of the product is there, Iker. And, and we were, we, you can raise your hand, Iker. <laughs> Don't be shy. Uh, and and so, so we had a team in Bilbao, Iker is in Bilbao, we had a team in Bilbao designing this product, we had a board who didn't want, and their Kickstarter became, for us, sort of the trial, the trial. Should we, are we going to get love, are we going to get indifference? That's basically, because that's what you get out of, you never get hate, you get love or indifference in Kickstarter, that's what you, I think you would agree with me. So it is, it is, is there love? So we thought, is there going to be love? Is there going to be love for us in Kickstarter? And we also did it, we didn't do what you did. What now I totally learned from you, Jaume, and which totally should have done, and you hired a professional video. We hire a guy who's good for a video that cost us 3,000 euros. We, we just wanted to do it the, what we thought was the Kickstarter way, which is the amateur way of just going somewhere, you know, we wanted to, we didn't want to go as professionals. We wanted, we didn't want to go with a super produced video that people say, oh, these assholes are cheating. They're a rich company and on top of that, they have this super produced video that I'm never going to back that project, right? We wanted to avoid the animosity of people. We wouldn't, we didn't want to go to Kickstarter to raise 250 and spend 250, basically. Uh, so we went in a very humble way with a home shot video with engineers of phone, like a, a, a simple thing. Uh, now, the good news is it worked. Okay, it worked. We raised 315,000 or 250,000. We didn't raise 10 million, but we didn't fail. Okay? And the, there was a backlash. There was a backlash. Why are you on Kickstarter? There was a backlash. We had people saying on Twitter, uh, phone doesn't belong on Kickstarter, right? 
I'm not going to back you because you guys already have money. Why am I going to back you? And I would answer, look, we're the crowdsourced Wi-Fi company. We are the company that gave Wi-Fi to everybody via crowdsourcing. Kickstarter is the crowdsourced product company. You, it's the crowd that decides, it's the community that decides. Do you get love, you don't get love. And we decided to try it out, and it worked. Uh, so that's basically a summary of my story. I, what, I, what I thought we could do now is maybe Jaume, you could, you, because since you now help other companies that want to do, go on Kickstarter, and there's people who may be watching us on video or people who are here, uh, why don't you share what you do for people who want to go on Kickstarter? How does your company work, and how do you, uh, what services do you provide for people who want to go on Kickstarter? Well, af after the second try, the successful try, uh, we, we realized that we had a lot of work done and a lot of uh, reports from the lawyers, from taxes, from a lot of things, and that we had a lot of information and we received lots of calls from people from Spain uh, asking us what, what, uh, what do I have to do to, to present the project in Kickstarter. So we decided to uh, create a company in Miami to help uh, with, local, with local partners, to help people uh, to make the jam and present the project in Kickstarter. And we're trying not only to support the, with the administrative tasks and, and with accounts and things like that, not only we not only give advice, we're trying to get involved in the projects because Kickstarter is a very emotional um, funding. I mean, you, you have to get the people emotion or try to cap, catch the people emotion in just five minutes. You have 30 days to uh, attract their, their, uh, their attention over you. And in five minutes, you have to uh, get their emotion in your project. And if you get that, uh, they're, going to, um, they're going to give you your money and their confidence more than your money because they, uh, it's, it's very difficult how, how um, people pay more or back, back, uh, give, you, give their money in, uh, in, in uh, pay more money to be a, a better tester. That's something that, they, for example, the video game companies used to pay for. But in Kickstarter, they pay for being a, a beta tester. So they, they want to get involved in the project. And that's very difficult, and we're trying to, to advise the people, how do, you get, how do you get that emotion into your project, through your video, through the structure of your project, through your rewards? And that's very important, that you have to understand that. And it's not only the structure of, your, of the project, that's a technical point of view, how do you explain the project to the people, but also how do you catch their emotion. And in fact, the most important thing also about that is uh, how do you get enough visibility for the projects? Uh, I mean, uh, I used to see it in, in, in a different way. If you are asking for $30,000, it's your goal, uh, and the average uh, pledge is around $30, for example, you need 1,000 backers to get your product funded. So, uh, uh, if you see the average uh, pledge uh, versus visibility, uh, it is around between 6 and 12% of the people that visit your project will give you their pledge. So if, imagine if, if the percentage, if the rate is around 10%, you will need uh, 10,000 people to get your product funded. But Kickstarter will only give you between 30 and 40% of the, of the total amount. You have to look for the 70% the or 60% of the rest of the money. You have to look, it, look for it uh, out of Kickstarter. And you have to push your community even before the launch of the campaign. You have to be preparing your campaign maybe two or three months before you launch the, your project. And, and that part is the most difficult part. How do you get involved in your community? Mm -hmm. And they have to be waiting for you. And, and that's, I, maybe that, that's the most difficult part of everything. Yeah, we're trying to get Wi-Fi to, uh, to show something on the internet. And I, I, would, I would like to say that Fernando is an amazing guy, I just realized, because I've been calling him Jaume, <laughs> by who knows what kind of mistake, because we just met, and he's been so polite. 
not to say, hey, what the fuck? I'm not Jaume, I'm Fernando. <laughs> so, Fernando, you're a cool guy, and I really apologize. Don't I totally apologize that I was calling you Jaume. Totally embarrassed. I was trying not to cut you. <laughs> <laughs> and I, no, it's, it's like, it's funny. My wife who's there sends me a message. He's not Jaume. <laughs> she knew, she was laughing at me. <laughs> He's Fernando, so thank you. Thank you for not complaining, and I'm really, really sorry. Okay, going back to Kickstarter, I think, I think the, um, it does make sense. I mean, I just met Fernando, but it does make sense to hire a company that knows what to do in Kickstarter, because we didn't, okay? And it's kind of like a world, okay? It is like a world, okay? And for us, it was like, oh, whatever, we sell a lot of products, so we'll just you know, kick ass on Kickstarter. And, but there's a language to Kickstarter that, that we, we, we should have known better, right? We should have known better. I mean, the more I listen to you guys, the more I think it's a miracle we raised our money. Wait, so <laughs> let me jump in. Yeah. So I think if you're raising 250000 or 100000 yeah, you need professional help. Those 5000 to $10,000 people, they do not need professional help. I think that's the big distinction. That 75% of people on Kickstarter they do it, as you said, they make the homegrown video, they throw it up, they talk to their community. It's actually quite straightforward. Um, but at the level that you guys are operating at, it is, it's a professional endeavor. It's not magic, yeah. Well, but also, I'm sure those people do their homework. Right? <laughs> yeah, I'm sure I bet they, they do. They read your handbook. At least half of them yeah. do, yeah. <laughs> they create our handbook. Yeah. They, they study what, what and, and that, that makes sense. We worked a lot on the engineering. We came out with a great product, but we didn't... Uh, I mean, I think what saved our Kickstarter was the, was the press. We got very good press. And that maybe if you can, if you can go to the Gramophone Project on Kickstarter, in the, in the end, what happened is we came out on Kickstarter FON, right? and we started getting phenomenal press. Uh, people like Gigaom, TechCrunch, uh, and many others. It's very slowly coming. Or Is that how you spell it? Right? Uh, with an O. An O. Gromo. Gramo. Gramo. Oh, Gramo, got it. Gramophone. Gramophone. Uh, and so we started getting a lot of positive press. And that's, that drove all the traffic, uh, or a lot of traffic. Then the other thing that's interesting about what happened to us is that a lot of people went to Kickstarter for the first time via the Gramophone. And they went, when they went on the, for the first time uh, let me see if, the, if there is a, um, yeah, here's a summary of the articles we were getting. So what, uh, as you go on and as you get more and more pe uh, people interested in your campaign and you get press, Kickstarter allows you to modify your campaign, sort of to add to your campaign and to say, hey, look, read this article. This is what people are saying. Uh, this is what I, I uh, the biggest traffic driver. And, and so that helps you gain, gain uh, a community. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say is what happens after you finish, okay? So we finished this campaign like a, a month ago. So what's interesting is now we have uh, 4,000, let's see how many backers we have. Now we have something like, yeah, almost 5,000 backers. And these backers are amazing people. They're awesome people because they are buying a product that doesn't yet exist, right? So they're doing it totally out of love. And, and they, these people want your product, but they're also critical of your product. And they also want the product to be better, right? So they say, so why don't you add this? Why don't you change this? And actually, some of the ideas are phenomenal, right? So it's not only this is a platform for getting backers and getting money. This is a platform for getting press getting feedback, getting, getting wisdom as to how does your product interact with the general public. I don't know if you'd yeah, agree. Yeah, ab no, absolutely. We talk about this all the time, and this is actually, you know, uh, we, you'll never, if you go on Kickstarter today, you will not find the word crowdfunding because we think it's so much more. We think the PR aspect, the community aspect, that we talk about bringing a project to life and doing it with a community. And that is really what's happening here every day. It's those 4,883 people, you and your team, and the thing that you're creating together. 
We, in, in the same line, we have introduced the, the Kickstarter in our business model. And it's a perfect idea because you, when you are presenting a project, you are testing your idea in, in your possible customers. So you have the possibility to, get, to have a better project or even to cancel your project before it even is produced if, if the people doesn't like. So it is a wonderful way to test your product, to test your ideas, and to take it live. Yeah, no, what I, what I also feel about Kickstarter is it's not only a very inexpensive way to, to succeed, but it's a very inexpensive way to fail, okay? Like, I've been building companies since 1990, and believe me, failure used to be much more expensive. You had to spend a lot of money to fail, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And this is, okay, I failed for 10,000 euros. Well, okay, or well, in the little ones, probably you failed for 500 euros. Well, I'd rather fail for 500 euros than fail after spending my savings, my family's savings, and everyone's savings, and then it turned out that nobody liked what I did, right? So this concept of people focus on success, which is good, but as we know, success requires a lot of failures, including Fernando's first failure to then become su a success, right? Um, Oculus Rift, I heard that they failed the first time they went, and then they... Did the, they? I didn't yeah, know that. I, I read that Oculus Rift, the famous Oculus Rift, who mm. now who was sold for two billion, okay, probably out of Kickstarter. <laughs> I mean, it went from Kickstarter to selling for two billion. That's probably the, the story you should say in your uh, in your presentation. <laughs> Oculus Rift. I heard, and I, maybe I'm wrong. I, if anybody can can rectify that, but I heard that Oculus Rift had a campaign or an attempt at a campaign that didn't work and then had a successful campaign. Well, here's the successful campaign, um, one of the most successful campaigns ever in terms of what they did and what they did afterwards. You know, they went from two million to two billion, okay? Uh, and and uh, they only had 9,000 backers, right? It, it's very interesting because they, I would say every backer on Kickstarter is worth like 100 people in real life. Like, when you are on Kickstarter and then you go to a, mar to a marketing or a shop or a chain or somebody, they will look at your backers of Kickstarter as people who are worth maybe 10 times the amount of money that you raised. So that is also important for, for validation. Um, it's the distribution channels. And I also heard that buyers, and maybe you can, you can I heard that buyers from shops from chains look at what works in Kickstarter no do yeah. you have any yeah. evidence we are, yeah yeah this is sort of that influence on culture thing uh, Kickstarter is a testing ground in more than one way ideas are happening people are exchanging ideas and where people are seeing energy they're saying hey there's something there so something like that 3d printing pen I brought up earlier obviously that was a great use case that other people saw happen and then started rushing to develop on their own uh, one thing that I wanted to ask you, because I, I am not very familiar with, is the whole aspect of, you said that movie creation is important and movies. I, I never visited Kickstarter for movies or anything related to arts in general. And since your background in Kickstarter is in arts and movies, I thought maybe you could share with us some projects that you thought were particularly exciting in movie creation. Uh, so, sort of what you alluded before. Sure, yeah, I'm gonna bring up, except I have, oh I know, I typed it in wrong. Um, yeah, so movie, film is one of the biggest categories on the site in terms of number of projects as well as dollars pledged. Um, and the kind of incredible thing is at this point, a lot of the, since we've been around for five years, even though they have long development timelines, a lot of them exist. So this is a partnership we launched with iTunes a few months ago. Um, to highlight some of the exciting films that have happened on Kickstarter. Um, they're largely documentary films and short films, which is great because these are things that can't traditionally get commercial funding. Um, it's hard to find investment for documentary films, for shorts, uh, which means that these are the kinds of things that travel to festivals, do really well, and then get purchased and distributed that really could not have even existed before, that find their way onto iTunes, that find their way into classrooms, that find their way into festivals. Um, so we were really excited to launch this page as sort of the first way to show off all the incredible work that's happening. Uh, we also do an annual film festival where we do a series of cuts of all the incredible film work. Where is the festival? 
Uh, typically, we do it in New York. This year, we'll do it in a couple other places that we haven't announced yet, so I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> And do you think the location of Kickstarter being New York and not Silicon Valley, is it a plus, is it a minus? It's got a plus or a minus. Um, I will say we have New York character. We grew out of the cultural scene. Our uh, first founder, he actually wanted to start a music festival and realized, I really wish I knew if people would buy tickets to this before I spent $25,000 on it. And then he, that's where the seed for Kickstarter grew um, in his mind back in 2002. Um, and then he, he's also an artist, and he met Yancey, who's also a music guy, and Charles, who's a designer. So that is a very New York story to have like three really creative people start a company versus uh, three guys who wanted to make a startup and sell it for a couple billion dollars. Uh, that is not our goal. We're really interested in being a fertile ground for creative projects. And uh, I wanted to ask uh, Fernando, concretely, Somebody here wants to launch something on Kickstarter. Well, maybe I should ask, is there someone here who would like to launch something on Kickstarter? Not at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there's one there. Okay, so the, why, don't you, why don't you tell us what you're thinking about, and let's do a real life here with Fernando advising you <laughs> and seeing if you would actually hire him. Um, hi, I wasn't prepared for this. <laughs> uh, my name is Morten, I'm from Denmark, and I'm working in a company called Delta, uh, it's a technology company. We have a small department called IDEMO Lab, where we do uh, ideation and electronic sketching for developing new concepts and uh, evaluating them. And uh, we've been developing our own electronic building blocks, like uh, little bits for adults, you could say, for, uh, for development. And uh, we've been thinking about making a crowdsourcing campaign uh, or community sourcing campaign uh, for them. Um, it's just a thought. We don't know uh, yet. Um, it's mostly for me, the thing holding us back is I don't know if we have the... Um, the mic closer to the mic. Uh, I don't know if we have the uh, resources to follow it up if we would actually get funding. Um, so that's... My main concern. Concretely, now. what would the product do and how much would it cost? <laughs> um, actually, I have it with me here. <laughs> um, it's, um, well, it, it's sort of like little bits, but it's more flexible and it's, um, it can do more things. It's a set of electronic building blocks. Just a second. <laughs> Is there anything, Fernando, you can say in the meantime? For example, with a general description of the project, what would you do? You would, uh, how do you work? Do you charge a success fee? Do you charge, yeah. yes? Maybe yeah, so explain that. Yeah, yeah we, we work as a, with a success fee. We don't select the projects that we are working to because uh, I think the sel that selection must be made for the market. The community, uh, we are not God. We, we don't know what is going to, to, to be funded or not. So. I think the first thing we, we always tell all the projects is that they have to uh, think in the people they are going to show the project and trying to begin with the community they want to get involved with. So that's the first part before even to, to design the project, is how, how, how can you connect with the people in the social media to get a community around and after that you have to jump to Kickstarter. I have a friend who I was giving advice to a year ago about his Kickstarter project. He's a musician. He was really nervous about his funding goal. Um, and I said, well, you have fans, and they care about you. And he said, yeah, but my, my label manages all my social pages, so I don't really know what I'm going to do. And so I advised him to establish a social feed that was all his own and that he could really start to connect with fans and specifically get a sense of what they respond to. So he started posting pictures and music and different kinds of things and tracking the responses. Oh, these are the kind of pictures that people really like. These are the kind of new, this is the kind of news people really like. And then was able to, a year later, when he launched his Kickstarter campaign, really target. He chose one platform. He knew Instagram was very successful for him, but he knew Facebook had a higher click-through rate. Um, so he, he really focused on Facebook, and he also knew what kind of content to share. Like, his weirder, artier stuff, not so popular, obviously. But he did learn that through trial and error. So I think, to, to your point about figuring out community. Okay, and now, now um, we're coming to the end. I just wanted to ask, I, I think Kickstarter has a challenge, 
which is that projects are growing faster than backers. Is that, is that true or, or what is yeah. the rate of growth of backers and the rate of growth of projects, number of projects? Uh, so this is the stat I brought up earlier. Uh, if you remember, there's 63,000 projects and there's six and a half million people. Uh, typically a project has 100 backers. A lot of the money does come from the repeat backers, uh, but that's a, that's a good thing, that's a powerful thing. But in the last four months, the rate of growth of backers and the rate of growth of projects has been similar or more backers than projects or more projects than backers? They, they, there's always more backers than projects because like in your case, you brought in 4,000, almost 5,000 people with your project. So there's always more backers than projects. It's just a fact of the system. Uh, okay, so I thank you, certainly you two very much, Fernando, <laughs> Stephanie. Um, I'm glad we are more knowledgeable about Kickstarter than we were an hour ago. And I thank you all for being here. Thank you.